I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. This is Fish Jelly. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Okay. Yeah. You wanted to talk about the first wave of the Cannes Film Festival competition selection? Oh, right out the gate. You're just throwing throwing me in the ring. Well, get it over with. <laughs> well, well, you haven't read anything about anything. No. I have no interest in that. Go ahead. Wow. <laughs> I don't. When have I ever said I'm excited to see what's playing at any film festival? Wow. But it, but you do. So go yeah, ahead. It's a, well, uh, the, it's not a complete announcement because only the uh, competition and in certain regard because the separate um, programs will be unveiled. God, I, I don't know what's Monday, Critics Week, but then um, I'm very excited to see what's going to be in Director's Fortnight because there's a new Isabella Huppert film tipped to be playing there. Uh, but as far as the competition goes, uh, lots of very fun, exciting people there. I got Yorgos Lanthimos already, Jacques Audiard, Sean Baker, uh, uh, Gia Janka, Andrea Arnold, um, Paul Schrader, but I'm uh, yeah I'm very excited for Paul Schrader and uh, also the new uh, David Cronenberg and Christoph Honoré and uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's <laughs> and then you haven't have you looked up stills of well because you haven't because you're not interested apparently but um, Sebastian Stan playing Donald Trump in the eighties no in Ali Ali Abbasi's The Apprentice oh mm-hmm. no. Yeah, that is probably going to be uh, something interesting. Um, as far as other sidebar things that have come, oh, they're the new. I think they started the premiere section in 2021. Uh, they've relegated a few interesting people there, including uh, Leos Carax and Elaine Giraudy, uh, and I'm interested in both of their films. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's coming up quick. Oh, the new Guy Madden that he co-directed with Evan and Gail, Galen Johnson that has Kate Blanchett. That I'm excited for. Um, Furiosa, of course, but that's just... I, I don't know if I'm going to make time to see that there. To celebrate Francis Ford Coppola's return to the Cannes uh, Film Festival <laughs> competition with his upcoming Megalopolis, <laughs> World of Real asked over 100 critics and influencers, including Nicholas Bell, mm. to vote what they would consider Coppola's best film after 1979's Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse. What did you vote for? I voted for Peggy Sue Got Married. <laughs> what won? I think Bram Stoker's Dracula won that poll. Yeah. But they, they broke down the article uh, about the poll yeah, number two was Rumblefish. Which is good, yeah. Uh, number three was The Outsiders. Uh, I just rewatched that this week. More on that later. Number four was One from the Heart. That was, you know, they just did a 4K restoration of that. That was the movie that fucked him up. Because that was a, after Apocalypse Now, and it's set in Las Vegas, but he completely built Las Vegas using sets. Oh. Which was, of course, very effect, uh, expensive. And it starred Nastasia Kinski and Frederick Forrest, um, I think. I've only seen that once. But yeah, that, that kind of slowed his role hard. And number five was Peggy Sue Got Married. <laughs> have I seen that? No, but I think we have to watch that for Patreon coming up. Oh, we do? Yeah. You're right. Yeah, that Kathleen Turner's only Oscar nomination. I love it. It's, I think it's kind of a magical film and she's fantastic in it but oh, that is the movie that Cher uh, watched and caused her to have Nicolas Cage cast in Moonstruck oh well we can move on to the restaurant section we went to you know Ben and Jerry's ice cream they have shops yeah and we went to the one at like near the where the AMC Burbank is Burbank Burbank mm -hmm. and I know food prices have gone up but yeah. I was shocked at how much. <laughs> so I ordered a little brownie sundae. And for the, I, I didn't rec realize what the price was when I ordered it. And so the person who assisted us was very nice, but maybe was like new to their job because the person, the more experienced person working was being very strict with him, them about like, you can only do this. They can only have this. They can only have these toppings. No substitutes. Blah blah blah. <laughs> but I'm allergic to nuts. So, so 
I ordered the brownie sundae and they go in the back for a while and come back out with this little bitty like paper bowl with a little brownie at the bottom of it Mm -hmm. that had been heated up. And then they asked me what flavor of ice cream I wanted. And they gave me this little tiny scoop of ice cream. And then they said, I can only have whipped cream, hot fudge and walnuts. And I said, well, you can skip the walnuts because for people who don't know, and I'm sure you would care to know, I'm very allergic to walnuts. However, that doesn't usually stop me from eating walnuts. <laughs> yeah, you're not deathly allergic. You just become more miserable after eating them. Yeah, my mouth feels like I've been chewing on razor blades. Mm-hmm. But um, so I said, no walnuts. And the other person, the more experienced person was like, well, if they don't want that, then you can offer them another topping, which I declined. We paid $15 for that little bowl of ice cream. And I thought, okay, we could have bought like, three tubs of Ben and Jerry's ice cream tubs, whatever they call them and dump it in our mouths. Yeah. And we could have bought three little tubs of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And we could have bought a sheet of brownies from pavilion, a sheet. (laughs) So I was kind of shocked at how expensive it was. And in the same plaza, there is a cold stone Mm -hmm. and you know, cold stone has the three sizes, like, like it, love it, diabetes, it, whatever. The largest size Beaties. is only like $10. I'm, the the itis size. The, the, yeah, the itis, the, the, the sugar <laughs> size was, is cheaper than that. So then I regretted my purchase. And, I, you know, I hate when I regret my purchase. Yes. Because we, we could have just gone across the, had, the way. We had to talk you uh, off the ledge about the subpar. You know, maybe it was Weight Watchers Wednesday. That's why the portion was smaller. Maybe they were looking out for their clients. Imagine. I, they, <laughs> nope. Today is half the size of everything. Same price, though. Or if you look big, they tell you you can only have like half portion. <laughs> They're like, look, we don't want you to collect. And they charge you the same to try to get, like, to try to condition you to not eat like that. <sighs> yeah. I, I. What do I have to do to poison myself at low cost? The good thing about being frugal is that these higher prices are deterring me from buying unnecessary snacks. Mm-hmm. Like, you know. So in Europe, for, you'd eat less. Fortunately, we're not struggling to buy food. But even with that in mind, I still have a hard time. Like, I refuse, I refuse to pay full price for ice cream, which is often... And I only like certain brands of ice cream because I don't eat like fake ice cream. Mm-hmm. So if one of my preferred brands is not on sale, then I just won't eat it. So it's kind of helped me out a little bit. But yeah, I, I'm i surprised. The other thing is Cold Stone, you can't buy Cold Stone in a grocery store. But you can buy Ben & Jerry's at every store. You know what? I didn't realize that. So would okay. like... It seems kind of audacious to charge these crazy prices for ice cream that you can literally buy at the gas station. Mm-hmm. I could go to any, the highest, the most marked up Ben and Jerry's ice cream is still like half the price of what they charge at their shop. This business model doesn't make any sense to me, but, and then they don't have great toppings. Like the presentation was, the uh, presentation left, was weak. Left a lot it wasn't even a branded bowl. Like, <laughs> well, come on. Like for marketing purposes, why would you let someone walk out of your store with like an, an unmarked bowl? So then if someone saw it and it looked good, meanwhile, Colstone is across the way with a full line of people. We were in there. We were the only people getting ice cream. So then I felt stupid. Anyway, uh, I'm bringing this restaurant up mainly because I feel sad for the Arclight. So the Arclight, <laughs> well, you know, the Arclight was a favorite. In Hollywood. The Arclight in Hollywood, people probably know it for the Dome, has been closed since the pandemic mm-hmm. or lockdown which is unbelievable to me. I, I wouldn't, I, I just can't, I never would have thought that that theater in particular would close down. Right. And it's sad to, I spent a lot of time there because I used to work in that salon Republic. So I would, I would be there all the time. So it feels strangely like familiar. And then you would go to a lot of screenings there. I'll go to a lot of press screenings, but even before I started getting, uh, cracking into the press screening, uh, bullshit, I, when we first moved to LA, when we lived in West Hollywood, I was there a lot. I remember seeing the devil's double there, like right after we moved here. Yeah. I always liked going to that one. It just feels like you're doing something like the vibe of it. I always, even though that area I don't love, I I think I have fond memories of 
because it's near Ivar and I, you know, I that area has a lot of, uh, I think, like sentimental value to me. It does, then, but a lot of the stuff I used to like to go to is not there anymore. Amoeba's gone. Well, well right. it moved. Yeah, that's the point I'm making. So it's kind of a bummer. And then, so now all that's there is the Salon Republic and then uh, a gym. So that's really the only traffic. And then that's really all you need in LA. The only reason we were there last week is because we went to the Netflix headquarters to see Hitman, yeah. the new Glenn Powell movie. Mm-hmm. And well, new R- Richard Linklater, but <laughs> oh, so the, the, the director is more notable than Glenn Powell. In my uh, sure. Sorry. And then, uh, but Netflix had us park in the Arclight parking structure. So yes. then we thought, oh, well, we should probably eat something before we go. Because they said they would have a reception, which they did, but they didn't offer wine until after the movie. Smart. Which I guess is smart, mm-hmm. but <laughs> by that point, I wanted to just go home. I don't want to mingle with any of these people. Anyway, there's a new restaurant at that plaza. It's called Wild Bird. And based on the name, I assumed it was going to be one of those like Dave's Hot Chicken, you know, where they only sell like fried chicken, stuff that'll give you heartburn. Mm-hmm. But this restaurant was actually quite good. And it was like, they didn't have fried chicken. It was like rotisserie, grilled chicken. The options were, I mean, relatively like healthier options. And the prices weren't bad. No. And I, it, it's a bummer because I don't know that I would ever make the effort to go there specifically just like just to eat at that place. Mm-hmm. My hope is that the arc light reopens. I thought Netflix bought it or something. I was on I thought I read some, like someone had bought it and had intentions to reopen it. Yeah, I think that'll come back. Yeah, because it's sad to see like all the windows are boarded up, which just looks so unsightly. Yeah. Anyway, there's something and uh, sorry to this man section because last week or the week before, I think I was trying to describe uh, like an armchair as like a lazy boy or a lazy Susan. Uh huh. Which is like a kitchen thing. Yeah, I, I thought we we uh, clarified that. No, we did. Oh no, we, well, we clarified that it's like lazy Susan is not what the word I was looking for. What I was looking for is a lazy boy. Uh huh. That's what I was trying to say. Who are you saying sorry to? A line of chairs. The world. Okay. That I couldn't conjure. <laughs> but yeah, the the word I'm looking or the the term I'm looking for is lazy boy. Like one of those nice big like armchairs that reclines and turns. Anyway, films released we didn't cover. (laughs) Sting. Uh, Yeah, we almost covered this. I mean, uh, giant spider film. I don't know why it's called Sting, but it was getting middling reviews. It's the second Jermaine Fowler feature that came out this week. The trailer didn't interest me. Directed by Kia Roach Turner. I still have the link. I don't know if I'll watch it damaged i did want to see this again i hadn't didn't have enough time with uh, sam jackson and vincent cassell in flames directed by terry mcdonough in flames was pakistan's official submission for best international feature this past year directed by zarar khan i believe this played at Cannes last year in uh director's fortnight but sounded strenuous and i have not seen it yet Leroy, texas uh, Shane Atkinson, the writer of Palms, that older cheerleader film with Diane Keaton that Angelica Houston cast aspersions upon before its release. Uh, he's got this movie that came out starring Steve Zahn and John Magaro, who I like both of them. I think it's interesting that Steve Zahn is, I've been wanting to rewatch a late 90s film he did called Happy Texas. And now he's also in Leroy, Texas. Sasquatch Sunset. I with the screen the press screenings for this happened, I think the week before, and we didn't none of them fit our schedules. I, I saw this in Berlin. It premiered in Sundance. I really liked this film with Jesse Eisenberg and Riley Keough as two of a clan of Sasquatches roaming around. <laughs> uh so there's no dialogue. It's just this clan of um uh, big feet uh having sex, uh getting hurt eating, doing all kinds of shit in the woods. But I thought it was very entertaining. Lastly, Sweet Dreams. Um, This, oh, we also had a screener for this. Didn't have time. Johnny Knoxville starring as the coach of something, something, something. Um, Do you remember he did a movie in the mid-2000s where he played a coach for some special needs kids or something? Do you remember that? No. He did. Um, But this was directed by Lige Sarkey. Projects of interest, an untitled Chris Farley 
Is it biopic or biopic? I think you can say either. I say biopic. I would say biopic. Biographical picture. But I think no one's going to get myopic with you if you say biopic. What would you like to say about this project? Uh, Josh Gad is directing it, but uh, they announced that Paul Walter Hauser is playing Farley. I forget Farley was only, I think, 33 when he died. Mm -hmm. Lucky. Untitled prison film. Damien Chazelle moved on to his next feature after his big flop, Babylon, which I really liked. Um, but uh, the the it cost a lot of money and it didn't... I think it was a loss of like $87 million for the studio. But yeah, he's, he's working on a new film that it sounds like they're trying to fast track, but no cast has been announced yet. 28 Years Later 2. I hope they change the title of that. I, um, well, they should just say... Oh. Can they call it 56 years later? <laughs> so this is because they're made because. Or they could do 56 divided by two years later. Because <laughs> who made 28? Who's making 28 years later? Wait. 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 So what are the. She, well, the first there's one. 20, there's something called 28 days later. Yeah. Danny Boyle. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then 28 weeks later. Which is significant recently for us because didn't we review something that was. Alex Garland wrote that. And well, the, no, Alex Garland wrote the first one. And why is he? Uh, re- well, he directed uh, Civil War. Okay, that's mm-hmm. what it was. And, and then, so there's 28 days later, 28 weeks later. Yeah. And then you're saying that. And Danny Boyle has come back to direct 28 years later with uh, Killian Murphy and Ray Fiennes. And oh. I, I believe that maybe already filmed. Um, and and then now it's been announced that Nia DaCosta, who directed Candyman, in 2021 and um the marvels which i hated um she's gonna do 28 years later too that's kind of interesting yeah so like if they do like back to back like we get danny Boyles, and then a year later we get well because it must be the timeline between the first two was a matter of weeks (gasps) 28 years later and some change. Yeah. Maybe they can call it They that. need to come up with a better title, though. But uh, I guess she's on board for that. Good for her. Daniela Forever. Uh, Nacho Vigalando, who I think because of his, was it his first film? His his no, most notable film, Time Crimes, which I liked. And I think I still hold out for him to do something special. Um, I, although Colossal with Anne Hathaway was pretty entertaining. Do you remember that one? No. Where she is, Oh, there's like a they're in Korea? No, well, she's like a drunk and she finds out when she goes to this playground, she's generating this giant avatar that's killing all these Koreans, I think. Yes. <laughs> I do remember. And because the guy in it is someone I recognize. Jason Sudeikis is one of them. Oh, okay. And then uh God, I remember Tim Blake Nelson. Who's the other one? Anyway, um yeah, he's got a new film. Wake of Umbra. The great Mexican auteur, Carlos Regaras, apparently has a new feature. It's been since 2018 um, that is uh, zipping along. I guess it finished filming its segment in Poland. I didn't read what it's about. You know, I interviewed his wife uh, because she directed a film called Robe of Gems, which was in Berlin in 2022. And she told me that he was location scouting at the time then in Poland. Um, But yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Lastly, The Wave. Sebastian Lelio has a feminist musical, apparently, that he made. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, that should be great. Unfortunately, there are entries in the obituary section. Eleanor Coppola. It's a bit Coppola-heavy podcast. Yeah, the day after it would, can confirm. Oh, that's right. Francis Ford Coppola's new film is playing Eleanor Died. Um his, his wife, wife of like 63 years or something. Uh, she was a director herself. She very notably directed a documentary about the making of Apocalypse Now called Hearts of Darkness. Uh, but, you know, she did a film starring Diane Lane, who her husband cast in like four or five movies, uh, called Paris Can Wait that I think is actually quite lovely and magical. Uh, so if you haven't seen Paris Can Wait, is that the title of it? Yeah, sorry, now I'm getting in... It, that Deborah Winger, Billy Crystal movie, forget Paris knocking around in my head. But um, yeah, it's uh, unfortunate. Then we have Barbara Rush. I think we, I saw that she died right after we finished recording last week's podcast, but 
she's most notable, I think, from a film a classic sci-fi film, It Came from Outer Space. And lastly, Orenthal James Simpson died, which I I feel strangely emotional about, but I think it's 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 weird because he's such a he was such a big part of my life before my dad looks like OJ Simpson. Mm-hmm. So ever since I was a kid, I thought like I always felt that there's some weird connection with that, but then also I don't have a great relationship with my dad. So it's not like I have a fondness for the likeness of OJ Simpson. I just, you know, just being very familiar with who he was. And then my dad liked football. And then of course, um, him going on trial, the the trial of the century. Yeah. And then of all the sort of like nineties pop, you know, culture events i feel like this is the one i'm probably the most familiar with like you know we sat through that eight hour documentary we've watched other documentaries the ryan murphy show i've read so much about it Mm -hmm. um so you know it's i think oj is uh not a good person uh he certainly uh abused (laughs) he was an abusive person who i think was responsible for the death of those two people Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson, Uh even though he was acquitted of the criminal trial, but lost the civil suit. And then his dumb ass got arrested in Vegas for rob robbery and kidnapping, trying to steal back some shit he used to own. Yep. And then, you know, I, so I don't have a fondness for OJ Simpson and I do think he was a bad person and a race traitor. And I think his commentary, uh, on his, uh, position as a black man or, uh, confusing and problematic to me but Mm -hmm. so you know i'm not necessarily sad it just um it's just a weird like it just felt weird when i saw it i was kind of shocked yeah i was downstairs and i heard you i heard a sharp intake of breath like you stabbed yourself or something but i don't know i mean i don't know it'd probably be like when i find out my own dad is dead like i'll be like oh that's weird but you know good for him i guess i don't know (laughs) but yeah what a what a i don't even know how to describe him i don't want to come across like i think oj is someone to revere um i saw one headline naked gun star oj simpson dies like okay that is not the thing he's most known for on all the memes you know making fun of him which he i'm not gonna say doesn't deserve but um yeah it just he's such an interesting case study and then everything i mean that like trial is just such an uh i mean you can literally make an i you know i have a hard time sitting through long things and that eight hour documentary was riveting yeah we went to a press screening of that and they had to feed us halfway through north and hollywood give us numerous yeah. breaks it was in burbank I think. it was oh, was it in right? burbank i thought it was noho but um well it was that weird like the stretch of um Around that curve, just around, around the river bend, as yeah, someone heading, might say. To, yeah, heading to uh, CBS or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, they had to. We had to take intermissions. There's like four other people in the room, and they fed us lunchtime and gave us cookies too. Yeah, it was a lovely day. But no, I don't. I I I think he's an inter. Like I think you could take a class on O.J. Simpson. Oh, everything. Yes. And it would be all encompassing, re- re- revolving about around race relations in the United States, the criminal justice system, um, it, like the media. There's so much, and so I, I think he's a fascinating character. But I definitely think that um, he is a bad person. I and- still laugh thinking about that documentary Marsha Gay Harden being like I had a way of talking with black women they liked me and then immediately and then the way the, the documentary was edited the jurors are like we couldn't stand that bitch <laughs> then you see a black woman like yeah we couldn't stand her ass <laughs> but uh, also why are you still saying that girl well I felt for her a little bit because, I did too but well not a little bit more than a little bit because I think you know she recognized that this man was an abusive person who clearly was involved in this and the semantics of that trial and but it's so complicated. That it's complicated. It, it's it, Christopher Darden kind of fucks some shit up, you know. Yeah, and then but but then it's like at the center of it, there was this man who was abusive, and because of his stature in his community and in you know culture, he was allowed to get away with this. I mean, this woman called the police. How many Nicole Brown Simpson 
reported abuse from this man numerous times. Yep. And this wasn't vague. This was her literally saying like, y'all know OJ and he hit me again. And I guess you can send police down here, but I know you're not going to do any. I mean, how clear does it need to be that this person is dangerous? Yeah. And then I'm just, I could literally go on and on about all the little things in the trial that are just so fascinating and I mean, related to race relations, but also just like we, well, we're going to talk about it on Patreon, but we, we, we rewatched eye for an eye. Mm -hmm. Well, you walk, you rewatched it. I'd never seen it, but how the rapist killer gets off mm -hmm. because of a technicality. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, but how many other trials does everybody know the names of the lawyers, the judge, right? Like, you know, it's just, and then the the low speed chase. Oh my god! I mean, that was. I remember sitting in our house and like everyone, like people coming outside to talk about it, to then run back inside to look at it, and like like people were kind of like leaving, like doing shifts because mm -hmm. no one, someone had to be glued to the TV. Yeah, just wow. Well, he's gone, y'all. So hopefully, uh, the you know the Goldmans and the Browns uh, have been very, you know, vocal. Sometimes to a point that it's. I mean, I don't know. We can. We're probably going to talk more about victims and vengeance and on Patreon when we talk about eye for an eye. But yeah, there's a point where you wonder how good is this to hold on to. But at the same time, like I don't know it, it, that Sabid denied any kind of sense of actual justice is... well to also know that someone who i know is and believe is responsible for the death of my loved one and then they're out here free they're on twitter slash x you know oj was quite active on x like posting videos talking about random stuff mm -hmm. you know in las vegas on the golf course and it's like you know that would be aggravating i, I think i would have to remove myself from yeah because i'm sure the family these families keep track of him and i and I would think that that would be the last thing I'd want to do. Not unlike Sally Field in, in, in Eye for an Eye, but enough about that. Let's take a break. This week's secret film was my choice, and I chose the 1979 American sports drama film Rocky II. Rocky. Written, directed by, and starring Sylvester Stallone. His uh, sophomore directorial effort. Why did I choose this film? Well, uh, we reviewed Rocky on the podcast, mm -hmm. and that was one of our more uh, downloaded episodes. So oh. I'm taking advantage of that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but also because Rocky 2 is leaving Max, the streaming platform, soon. And you didn't want to pay for it. And I'm it. not paying for this shit. And I don't own these films. Because we saw the trailer <laughs> after watching the first one, and the trailer is can't be like I mean, it just seems like this movie is going to be ridiculous. So I was kind of I, I was looking forward to it ultimately a uh, little disappointed, but mm -hmm. what is Rocky II about? Rocky struggles in family life after his bout with Apollo Creed while embarrassed champ insistently goads him to accept a challenge for a rematch. Oh God. These, I don't think anyone, <laughs> I don't think there's an official copywriter for these IMDb premises, but Rocky II is basically the first Rocky. Uh -huh. I mean, it's the same format. So this time, Rocky now has Adrian, played by Talia Shire. So, speaking of another Coppola another connection. Coppola. <laughs> and of course, Rocky is still Sylvester Stallone. And he, uh, as we know from the last film, and if you don't remember, the first seven minutes of Rocky II is the fight, the, the end of the fight in Rocky One, where he went all 15 rounds with Apollo Creed but Apollo Creed ends up retaining his heavyweight title by a decision. So we see in Rocky II that the public is maligning Apollo Creed because they're saying, you're no real champ. You had to win by decision. That man dragged your ass out for a full 15 rounds. And many people think that actually Rocky should have won. So Apollo Creed is antagonizing Rocky because he wants a rematch. Mm -hmm. However, Rocky is now married to Adrian. We get a little wedding mm. and Adrian's pregnant and Adrian is, has made Rocky promise he will not fight again. So he agrees to that, but uh, we see that Rocky takes his little $37,000 he earned from that fight 
and spends it all. Every penny. Buys a car, fur coats, Rolexes, a house. A mortgage with a mortgage of 9.5. And wow. he uh, he runs out of money. Mm-hmm. So he's like, what am I going to do? So we get a little montage of him trying to find work. And basically they're like, you're dumb. You can't read. You don't have a high school diploma. You can't get a job that isn't like manual labor. So he, in the beginning of this film, while he's recuperating in the hospital because he had to get surgery for his eye and his broken nose, his brother-in-law, Polly says, hey, can I get your old job working for that Italian mob guy? Joe Spinell. Mm-hmm. So Rocky says, yeah, I'll put in a good word for you. So now Polly has Rocky's old job, which is whatever, because Rocky doesn't want to do that kind of work anymore. But after Rocky can't get a sit down job, as, as he calls it, <laughs> an office job, he ends up taking Polly's old job at the slaughterhouse. But he ends up getting laid off. So times are tough. Adrian agrees to or convinces Rocky to let her go back to the pet store part time. (laughs) But Rocky says, I have to fight. Like, this is the only way we're going to be okay. We can't pay these bills. If I fight Apollo Creed again, I'll make a ton of money. This is what we need to do. So he starts training with his old trainer, Mick, who we need to talk about, but looks like he died through. Mick looks like he died at the end of the last movie and they have just reanimated him Burgess, to be in this Mer- movie. Burgess Meredith who lived till 1997 mind you looks like they plucked him out of a pot of boiling 1997. water 1997 yep so that means he lived another like 18 years after this movie yes and I wouldn't have thought he'd live 18 days after this movie he, he looks so bad it looked like they needed to hurry up and finish shooting uh anyway mick is telling rocky dude that man almost killed your ass in the first fight and now you're uh, the, like your eye because rocky the damage to his eye was so bad that he doesn't have like peripheral vision <laughs> in his right eye and mick is like if that man almost killed you last time he will certainly kill you this time like you're there's no way but rocky says i'm doing it and the fight is like on Thanksgiving. So we're we're told that the the time between the first fight and the upcoming fight is only 10 months. But the timing of everything else is really vague because somehow in that 10 months they get married, pregnant, Rocky has to train. Like okay. So Rocky starts training with after he convinces Mick to help him. But Rocky's heart is not in it. He's like half-ass training. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's not ready to fight a kid. And then Adrian, um, I guess due to the stress of everything, (laughs) goes into like premature labor. Her brother does go scream at her. Her brother screams at her like, bitch, you ain't shit. Like you got Rocky over here all guilty and worried. You're going to get him killed. Like you need to support your man. And then she literally collapses, Mm -hmm. has a premature delivery. Hemorrhages. Mm -hmm. And because of all the bleeding, she ends up in a coma. And so Rocky stops training. He's like, I'm going to spend every day in this hospital room until you wake up. He won't even see his new baby. Because they have to see it together. Because they have to see it together. And Mick tells him, we'll get into it, but Nick gives this like long speech in a church and says, well, I guess I'll just sit with you. And so we get all these scenes of Mick just sitting in the hospital room with Rocky looking dead. Yep. And then one day Adrian just wakes up and she's like, I and want she you. looks fresh as a daisy. Yeah. And she goes, I want you to go out there and fight or whatever. Well, she no, does. she says, I want you to promise me one thing. And Rocky thinks that she's going to say, stop fighting. But she says, win. I want you to win. And Burgess Meredith screams. And he's like, let's go. And then Rocky, then we get the obligatory montage of Rocky training and he's going 150%. And Uh then they duplicate from the first movie that you said that people calculated the run. Yeah. And that Rocky, like running through Philly up to the steps. Would have been over 30 miles, like over a marathon. And he run, and we need to talk about the run, but oh he uh, he's ready to fight. And so the end of this movie is just like the first movie where we have this fight against Apollo Creed, which lasts like 15 minutes. I thought this fight was the first fight in Rocky one was so like, you, you know, I was sitting on the couch, like screaming, like, go Rocky. I was so hyped. This one, I was so annoyed and we can talk about it, but this fight ends with, Rocky knocking out Apollo Creed. Well, so he wins. Considering that Stallone, who wrote the first film, but is has complete creative control. And then that's it. Rocky wins the end. Yeah. Okay. 
Notably, um, uh, Polly and Adrian are not at the fight, which, which apparently out of all the Rocky movies, this is the only Rocky film where they are not in attendance at the fight. So where to begin? <clears throat> I think, I don't know that Sylvester Stallone should have wrote and directed this film. Um, I think that Rocky comes across for, oh, in the uh. first film, the charm of Rocky was that, yes, he's a little simple, but he's sweet and he seems to be aware enough, like the way he handles Adrian. Mm -hmm. He knows he needs to be gentle with her and he's not a fighter. He's a lover. And I, I, I don't know how this character who was able to accomplish all he did in the first film comes back in the second film and he seems like a complete moron. He talks too much. He is a annoying character to be stuck with listening to. Oh, oh my, my God. God. I was so annoyed. All Rocky does is ramble on about nothing. He's Nonsense. Just, it's just like he sounds so stupid. And I'm assuming it's because Sylvester Stallone wanted to like, because he was nominated for an Academy Award right in the first film so i wonder if he thought oh well maybe if i do more talking this time i i could win i like i just don't understand why rocky won't shut the fuck up uh even adrian when they're looking at the house and he's talking and adrian's like you don't need to speak well here let's <laughs> let me go through these notes so the opening of the film is the so we get the footage from the first movie but then we see after the fight and we see apollo creed and rocky being wheeled out of the arena to go straight to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And of course all the press is there and they're screaming and Apollo Creed screaming at Rocky. And, but then <laughs> reporters are asking Rocky, like, what were you thinking during that last round? And Rocky said, I should have stayed in school. <laughs> and then another reporter asked Rocky, do you think you have brain damage? And this fool says, I don't see any. <laughs> and I don't think these are lines are meant to be funny. I think that Sylvester Stallone thinks Rocky, because he says, I'm not punchy, meaning like, I guess, dumb. I'm just slow. I got a slow brain or something. A slow brain or something. But it's like, I, I don't know, Sylvester. I think that you wrote him. Oh, he says, I'm not punchy. I just got a relaxed brain. A relaxed brain. Okay. I think that Sylvester Stallone maybe didn't realize that Rocky does seem dumb as hell. Like, there is no relaxed braid. He seems dumb as hell. Like, dumb, but concerned with wearing um, heels, though. So to Yeah, he hands. dresses kind of... Yeah, he, he seems really concerned about his fashions. Mm -hmm. um, then when Rocky's in the hospital re recovering, the nurse asks for his autograph. And I thought that was funny because she's very like, my son would love your autograph. And then she pulls out a pad and tells, it, tells him, sign it. To my good friend, Charlie Flynn. Is that a prescription pad? Or? And I thought that was funny because Rocky couldn't even write down, in the first film, he couldn't even write people's first names and how much money they owed. Mm -hmm. But he's going to write to my good friend, Charlie Flynn. And then we see him writing it and the nurse looks at the pad and I'm assuming that he wrote Chicken Scratch. Yeah. <laughs> he probably wrote ba 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 ba. <laughs> okay, this wedding. Mm -hmm. He... <laughs> Rocky wants to talk to Adrian, and so he takes her to the zoo. In the, winter. <laughs> in the winter. And in the background, there's this, like, tiger just, like, aimlessly pacing back and forth. Which is uh, subtext, I guess, because the jacket I he wears. I have the tiger. And, and the jacket he wears. Yeah, yeah, so I thought that was funny. And then he asked her, and then immediately we go to the wedding, which felt very, like, okay. And then even the priest who's marrying them is, like, taking pictures. Like, they want Rocky's autograph. Mm hmm I feel like the film doesn't do a good job of explaining what a bit, what, like the fact that Philly's own Italian stallion, like got a chance to fight Apollo Creed and mm -hmm. did really well. Like they're making it seem like he's like, people know, he, I, I, I don't know that it was very well done. Like the impact that that first fight had on the community and Rocky himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we see that there are like some like agents. There are some slimy people trying to get Rocky to sign a contract so they can get him sponsorships. And Rocky's like, oh, I don't know. I'll do, I'll do it later. I'll call you. But then we see Tony, the Italian mob guy who Rocky used to work for, who we should trust because in the first film, Tony like took care of Rocky. Gotso. So. That's his name. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Tony's like, hey, 
you know, you got this money. Why don't you invest in condominiums? And Rocky's like, oh, condominiums, you know, you shouldn't like, like I got a deal like where you can get in on some condominiums. And Rocky says, um, I don't wear those. I don't wear them. So Rocky, his dumbass thinks condominiums are condoms. And then Tony just looks at him and goes, all right, and walks away. <laughs> I just, I was so disappointed. Like this guy who took care of you in the first film just kind of like gives up after he, he already knows you're stupid. So I, I kind of felt like we needed a scene where Tony's trying to explain to him, like, dude, if you don't spend your money wisely, you're going to run out. Mm -hmm. And then what do we get? We get a montage of Rocky just spending every little penny shopping. He buys a fancy Trans Am. He buy he wants to buy that he can't drive well. That he can't even drive. He wants to buy Adrian new wardrobe. We see her in a mink coat. Then he goes to a jewelry store and it looks like he's buying Rolexes from multiple people. Then, like you already alluded to, they go house shopping. Mm -hmm. And Rocky just walks into this house. I like it. Are these good bricks? Are these good bricks? Like Everything better be good in here. I'm going to come back and find you to the real estate agent. And then even Adrian's like, I think that you're making it really easy for this guy. I think the way Adrian's written is confusing. I agree. Because she seems simple, but not slow. She also seems terrified. But then, yeah, then every scene with her and Rocky, she seems terrified of him. She, but yeah. that's not the the subtext we're getting from their interactions or how he treats her. She also Talia Shire has what let's say thirty lines of dialogue in this. Fifteen of those lines are "I love you." Um, yeah, she says "I love you" too many times. A lot. <laughs> you know, she reminded me of because at first you're like, is she desperately unhappy because he's acting so stupid? It reminded me of how I think my grandmother felt marrying my grandfather, my matriarchal grandmother, who I was close to because she hated him and thought he was stupid. I was getting like <laughs> 1940s, like woman who marries a man under duress combined with love on the spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> These yeah. two people seem like they are vulnerable adults mm -hmm. who should not be allowed to um, There has to be someone make decisions for themselves. Steering them from the outside. Yeah. I, it, but, but then it's confusing because like you already said, when Rocky tells a real estate agent, like, we'll take it, even though he hasn't even toured the entire house, there's an entire upstairs where all the bedrooms are. He hasn't even looked at. She's like, Adrian goes, you haven't gone upstairs. And they could, they're at the foot of the and stairs. And they're literally standing at the foot uh. of the stairway. And Rocky uh, and Adrian reminds him like, well, the loan officer said that we qualify for 16,000 with 9.5% interest rate, which seems really high. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm very grateful for our two and three quarter interest rate. But anyway, um, Adrian's aware enough to even ask the real estate agent about property taxes. Doesn't that seem like out of her scope? Well, yeah. And so I don't know. Copper plumbing. Like so I don't understand how she could be that aware, but then she would allow Rocky to spend all of his money well, on shit that they don't need. Also, girl, your man is a dumb dumb. What do you think he's going to do outside of fighting? And then and that, you work in a pet store. Yeah. I'm so frustrated that there's no conversation of like, what are you going to do next? Like, it literally is like, oh, I got, like, I fought a fight. I got 37,000. I bought all this shit. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, I don't have any money. Yeah. And, and I don't want to fight. And you're going to have a baby and you got a big dog. And, and you're some, pregnant. Some and you, you know, that dog eats a lot. Uh -huh. And then it's like, well, I got to get a job. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, but then you already said this, like keeping in mind the entire time. And we're only like, 40 minutes into the film, Rocky is nonstop talking. Yes. To the point where just Adrian says, you don't have to speak. Just jibber jabber. I think that was Talia Shire. Yeah. To, like she ad libbed that. Like you don't have to speak. Um, we have the version of Max, the streaming platform where we have to watch commercials. Yes. They, and Little Caesars has these new, I they're called Crazy Puffs, and they look like little, what do you call those bagel uh, bites? Yeah, I think bagel bites. I have not hated a commercial this much since that damn Drew Barrymore commercial <laughs> on the train. <laughs> what was she trying to sell? Freebie, I think, right? For IMDb. Oh, <laughs> God damn. But these little, the, the man, if anyone knows the commercial I'm talking about, it's the two people, two whole ass adults on a carousel. Doing what? And the person who who's a person of color mm -hmm. who looks like. And the, and the lady's Asian. A, a, Not that that's important, but the, the 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 man looks like he looks like 
a little seven year old girl. Oh my God. Who's now like grown up into a man. I, I, oh, I hate it. I hate how he looks. I hate his hair. I hate, I how hate he's the way he's, his acting. And then he's screaming about these crazy puffs. And then all of a sudden, the carousel horse like just breaks out of the wheel. Mm -hmm. And then the the ride attendant is like, be free, whatever the horse's name is. Be free, Treacle House or whatever. Treacle House. Uh, but if, oh my God, why are we eating these shitty, greasy uh, li little bagel bites from Little Caesars on a carousel? Why are you that are only three ninety nine? They're only three ninety nine. I am gonna go buy some. But why are you? I, because I'm curious. Why now. are you eating on the eating them on there and getting all these? these horses on the carousel dirty you know that commercial work though because i do want to go get and we have a little i've never been in it but there's a little caesar's like almost walking distance to our house it but felt anyway, like we were being brainwashed speaking of greasy mick <sighs> keeps telling rocky he needs to be greasy fast <laughs> like so i'm assuming greasy is like slippery like you need to be slippery fast mm -hmm. but before we get to that and speaking of commercials Rock, those greasy ass mm -hmm. uh, agents do convince Rocky to do commercials. And Rocky does a commercial for um, Cologne. What was it called? Like, uh, oh, Beast Aftershave. Yeah, Beast. And <laughs> first of all, the, the agents are like, oh, we can get you like a Rocky doll. And they, <laughs> the premise of the Rocky doll is you can kick it, you can beat it. <laughs> Well, Rocky has to do this commercial for Beast Aftershave, and he has to dress up like a caveman. He looks like Bam Bam. Mm -hmm. He looks stupid, and he's like, I don't know about do I love you? And he... That's why I got frustrated with Adrian, because like she's telling him the truth, like, do I look stupid? And she's like, yeah. It's okay, like, then why... Bitch, okay. do you want him to earn money not fighting? Right. <laughs> Right. Why you you don't want him to fight? Y'all don't have any money. Why are you not helping this man get through this commercial? Because immediately <sighs> they prop his ass up on set, and he's supposed to read the cue cards, and he's really like, well, he can't read. He the, the, the he's supposed to say smells manly, and this fool says smell mainly. <laughs> Your man can't read, girl, and you have him out here. You don't even try to practice the lines with him. You see him up there struggling. You don't stop the taping to say, "Hey, can we can we go over these lines?" Can, can like can we take a like a ten and we can just go over these lines? It, it's just like so crazy to me why it, they make Rocky seem so dumb. Well, it's like these two are fucking helpless. <sighs> like just like the the frustration of the director who uh, Rocky calls rude is like. Well, yeah, you are wasting all these people's time. You know what else is rude? That these agents knew that their client can't read and has no stage. Like, he's not screen ready. Well, he has no. Like, he can't He can't enunciate. He can't project his voice. There's no like, charisma. Why would I take a client on who I know can't speak or read and then get them to do, like, a speaking spot for, like, a an advertisement? What? that's rude yeah if i were the director i'd be mad as hell oh yeah yeah I think, like and i'd be mad at the casting agent like i'd be mad at everybody i can't believe they gave him four hours of stumbling around mumbling like a dum dum. but uh then they cut to he's reading a louis lamore western <laughs> out loud to talia in bed and it's like oh god he's like you want me to and read he's more? like keep reading and she's like i like it uh, uh, she's not even helping him like okay which also reminds me of that grandma I mentioned because the dum dum that she was married to, he liked to read. Those. He would only read Louis L'Amour, who wrote a lot. So during this time, Rocky gets hired at the slaughterhouse, but then he gets fired or let laid off because they're like they're making cuts, and Rocky's the lowest in seniority. But at a point, Polly, Rocky's brother in law, Adrian's brother, he goes to Rocky and says, "You know, if Adrian's giving you a hard time, you should hit her." <sighs> You should, what did you say? You should knock her teeth out or rearrange her teeth. Rearrange her teeth. And then Rocky's like, well, I like her teeth. But really the only reason Rocky was talking to Polly is because he needs to sell his Trans Am because mm -hmm. he can't afford it. And Ro and Polly's like, if you need a handout, I'll give you a handout. So then it's like, I didn't love that Ro because Polly seems to be making good money mm -hmm. doing the same job Rocky was doing. But Rocky wasn't making good money. So once again, we're showing like Rocky's an idiot. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> why? Why? Are we... I have to say again, Mick Burgess Meredith looks like 
hell. He looks like in the movies when people get like radiation poisoning. <laughs> yeah. Were you on Three Mile Island, Burgess? Like what? he looks terrible. And then <laughs> he lo- well, because we we did a podcast a couple of years ago now about magic with Anthony Hopkins and Anne Margaret. Oh, that's right. And he's uh, at Tony Hopkins' agent in that, and he and that's only the year before this, and. I think he was wearing sunglasses though and was quaffed a bit, so he didn't look quite as terrible. But as Mickey, oh my god! And then Rocky, the, his fashions at some points, like the way it's shot, he looks like the priest from The Exorcist, Jason uh, Demi, Miller. or yeah. yeah, right? Is that is that Demi, <laughs> the the one whose mother gets killed? The one whose mother? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. Father yeah. Demi or uh, yeah, I, Damien. I, Damien, Father Damien, Father Damien. I feel like. Uh, Jason Patrick's dad. Yeah. I'm saying Demi because that's what his mom would call him, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, I thought Rocky looked like him sometimes. <laughs> the the cinematography was interesting. Well, the style too of the because even the faces Rocky makes, and then like these are interesting. So then now Mick is trying to train Rocky, telling him to chase a chicken around. Like okay, <laughs> yeah, chasing the chi- that which felt like innuendo. Um. Oh, when so then of course. Rocky in the waiting room or in the hospital room waiting for Adrian to wake up from the coma. Mick is there. And then when Adrian I, tells Rocky when, that's when Mick says, What are we waiting for? Like immediately screams that with that croaky ass voice. I but I it does it gets me that Rocky won't even go look at this kid. That's crazy. That that's crazy. So you and then the other thing is because the movie's not giving us a sense of like the timing, like the two fights are 10 months apart. Y'all got married. She got pregnant. Had she had a baby, baby. And the doctor who comes out says, oh, Rutania, uh, Rutania Alder from uh, Mommy Dearest. Mm-hmm. She tells uh, I'm assuming she was the doctor. She tells Rocky like, oh, well, it's premature. But the like she was far along enough that the baby will be fine. The problem is her, all the bleeding. She's in a coma. And Rocky doesn't understand a word she's saying. Rocky <laughs> thinks she's asleep. Does anybody, yeah, I'm like, does anybody explain to him what a coma is? You have to talk to Rocky like you're talking to like a five-year-old. Rutania Alda, Dr. Cooper. But anyway, when now that Rocky is motivated by Adrian telling him to win, now he has heart. So then we see him do his little training montage and then he goes for his 40-mile run. Mm-hmm. And I was reading that like hundreds of children were hired as extras, but we see that while Rocky goes on this run, kids are joining him like Peter Piper, P- the Pied Piper, or the Pied Piper. Who's Peter Piper? Oh, you know, I'm thinking of Petey Pablo. Peter Piper. <laughs> Didn't he pick a pack of pickled peppers? Oh uh, that- yeah, I was. Th- yeah, I, I totally messed that up. Pied yes. Piper. The Pied Piper who the lead- Pied Piper of R and B R Kelly. That's it. Oh yeah, yeah, leading uh, the children leading away. Leading the their children. All these kids are following Rocky and running with him, leaving their parents, and he runs up those steps. And then when all of the kids join him up top, it's like Rocky. The way Rocky looked and the way it was shot, it reminded me of Leatherface at the end of the first Texas Chainsaw yes. Massacre. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Stallone to me looks a bit jarring anyway. Uh, but the only thing that would redeem that stupid scene that makes no goddamn sense is if at the top of that, those stairs, there was a pit of fire they were all jumping into because that, it makes no sense. Why no. is that happening? No, it doesn't. <sighs> all these children, all these. Continue. The, these children that don't, are oblivious to what their parents are into are, are all chasing around this boxer. Yeah. I that, don't think so. That, that, that doesn't make sense, but we need to take another break. So Rocky's getting ready to go to the big fight and uh, he is driving his Trans Am, so I don't know if Polly gave it back to him, mm-hmm. like let him borrow his car. I don't. I thought that was weird. When he gave Polly the car, one Polly has a snow cone that he just throws on the ground, and then, uh, but it's like I don't trust that either of these two people were capable of transferring loan information, titles. Like- Speaking of the snow cone, they there's a press conference where Apollo Creed and Rocky have announced like that they are going to fight and Apollo Creed is just digging into Rocky. And then they're asking Rocky, like, how do you feel about Apollo Creed? And he goes, Oh, he's nice. And then they're like, what are you going to do with all this money? And this fool made a list, which was kind of charming. But then he says, Oh, and I'm going to get Polly a snow cone machine. So, is that like a thing with Polly that he likes snow cones? I guess he does. He also likes to litter. Um, but that 
that one of the uh, members of the press asked Rocky, like, do you have anything derogatory to say about your opponent? And he's like, derogatory. Yeah, he's great. Ugh, I find this shit taxing. So this is like George W. Bush saying, like, look what a C student can do. Fuck off. I thought the funniest mo- moment in the film <laughs> is when Rocky gets to the stadium and he gets into his little outfit and they're walking, you know, through the crowd to get to the ring. One of the announcers says, because <laughs> Rocky's wearing a gold and black robe. Mm-hmm. And one of the announcers goes, oh, I think gold and black are the colors of the high school he never graduated from. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's top level shade. <laughs> that is top level. Yeah, where do we, we need more That's of that. That's some shit I would, hope that i would be uh, quick enough to think of while the mic is hot because (laughs) but you know you know what else the film is doing i think purposefully is showing that rocky is happy-go-lucky and everybody else seems fucking miserable uh carl weathers is yeah he doesn't smile one time and his poor wife who uh who's played by sylvia meals she's only in this and one of the rocky and she died in 2011 which is why felicia rashad is this character in the Creed films, but everybody seems just pressed. I have to say it again. Um, his golden black robe are the colors from the high school he never graduated from. <laughs> <laughs> and then he snickers after he says it. So he knew he was being shady. <laughs> well, doesn't that same commentator, commentator say, I've never even been in a place with so many Italians. And then the other guy goes, uh, I just want the record to show that I didn't say I didn't shit. say that. <laughs> okay, okay. This whole weird racist shit. <laughs> um, the fight. I was so bored. All, all, the entire 15 minutes is just Rocky getting punched in the face. Yeah, I'm like, oh, God. And then the choreography is not great because, you know, they're not, these punches aren't actually connecting. So it's like Rocky, you know, flying his head back. Mm-hmm. And again, like you said, I think Rocky was injured right before the filming of that scene. Yeah. So maybe he couldn't do much, but it, I mean, it shows. It just, okay. So then they go the full 15 rounds and it's round. It, it's in between the 14th and 15th, 15th round where Mick is telling Rocky, like, you got to stop. You got to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to do that. I know what I'm doing. Do you? What is the plan? What do you know? And then when Mick tells him, okay, now switch to Southpaw. Because I don't know if we mentioned that. Oh, I don't think we did. No. The big gag in this story, because, of course, Rocky is a Southpaw, meaning that his dominant fighting hand is his left hand, which mm-hmm. is unusual. And then Mick explains that that's why you take so many punches because a southpaw's face is always like, for someone who punches right-handed, your face is always kind of like leading the charge. So Rocky's like, why didn't you tell me that? It's like, well, you don't listen anyway, dummy. So Mick comes up with the idea that you need the only way to get the upper hand on Apollo Creed is you need to surprise him by fighting with your right hand. So then they spend, we get a montage of Rocky training to use his right hand. Mm-hmm. So then now yeah. in the fight, he's right-handed and the commentators say, oh, uh, Rocky's using his right hand now. So the plan was that when the go, like when the time is right, you're going to switch to being a Southpaw because you're going to surprise Apollo Creed and that's when you can take his ass down. Uh-huh. So when things are like about to end and it's not looking good for Rocky at all, because we see that the judges keep giving each round to Apollo Creed. Mm -hmm. So even if they go the distance, Apollo Creed's still going to win again. Mm -hmm. So like Rocky needs to do something. I got know what I'm doing. I got a plan. What is it? You're just going to be a punching bag until the man gets so tired he collapses. Mm -hmm. And then when Mick says, Okay, now flip the switch. Be a southpaw. In the but in the last three minutes. In the literally the last three minutes of the fight, now, what does Rocky's dumbass say? I don't want to win using no tricks. Um, <laughs> okay, it's not dummy. a trick. It's not a trick. Everybody knows you're southpaw. It's not a trick. So literally. what I hated the most is that the film takes the fight to the final round, to the final few seconds, and, and then what happens? They both fall down at the same time. And then it's slow motion. Baby. So now the referee is counting them out in slow motion. One, two, and it's just like grating. And then of course it's like neither the way it's being shot and the countdown. It's like well neither of these two are going to get up by the count of ten. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, we go like nine, and then Apollo Creed collapses, and Rocky's able to stand up. 
and then there's pandemonium then now rocky so that uh the italian stallion is now the world heavyweight champ. and he looks like hell and then adrian adrian and then what is adrian doing she's, she's in with... this like crowd of like ten thousand people and she's going rocky no, Lucky. that's that's the first film. That's how the film opens. Oh, you're right. Yeah. In, the, in this film, oh, I'm so stupid. The the whole no. thing about this film is that she, uh, she's not at the fight. She's at home watching on the TV with her brother. <laughs> which filmed months later because Talia Shire was filming a much better film, uh, written by Paul Schrader called Old Boyfriends. That's all I have to say about this movie. I'm so disappointed that they made Rocky like this moron. And well, he did. Sylvester well, did that. Yeah, I can't say they. Sylvester Stallone made Rocky a moron. The, 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 the charm is gone. I did. Ugh. Of course, I want Rocky to do well because I feel bad for him. And I want Adrian to be okay because she married this dummy. So ultimately, I did feel good in the end thinking like, okay, good. <laughs> like, they're going to be okay for a minute. But um, yeah, I was just... Like I didn't have the same feels, which of course I wouldn't because it's a di- it's a slightly different, um, you know, Rocky's a different person in Rocky too. But yeah, I, Sy- Sylvester yeah. maybe needed to let someone else. Uh, well, I think John G. Al- Avildsen, who did the first one, was going to do this, but was connected to Saturday Night Fever, which I don't think he ended up doing. Uh, and then, so I, I think it wasn't planned originally for Stallone to do it, but he did. He had a film that I haven't seen that he directed before this called Paradise Alley, which was not a hit. But if you look at the poster, he looks just like he does walking around his Rocky. Um, so I, I think that this was a, a, a huge break for him because, of course, he would do Rocky three and four as director. Uh, John G. A- Avildsen, who also did Karate Kid, came back to direct Rocky five. <laughs> We're not known for, we haven't done many reviews on YouTube or Patreon or uh, the podcast where we do like sequels. I know we've done True to the Game 2 and True to the Game 3. Oh, God. (laughs) And then I don't think we've done any other, except maybe like a Marvel. No, we haven't even done. Like on the podcast? I'm saying we've never done reviews either for YouTube or the podcast where we do like uh, installments of a franchise. I think the only one is true to the game or where we, right. Can you think of any other films where we did like part one, two, two, three, we've done several Marvel films. Yeah. But that's like, that doesn't count. I don't think MCU counts. Sure. So this is the second time we've reviewed two films of a franchise. Uh, I'd have to double check, but sure. I feel like eventually I need to watch true to the game. The original because we yeah. skipped the first one yeah. to review two or three. Got get you got to go back to got get. I uh, feel like we need to do Rocky three now. Sure. Uh, more importantly, I think we need to do Godfather two. Ugh, I love it. Oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> I don't know why I have these like aversions. You like the first Godfather? I know, but I don't know why I get this attitude about shit. <laughs> it's so much better than Rocky. <laughs> what would you give Rocky two? Um, I feel like it sounds like a shit on it more, but I, I think two and a half. Cause I think some of the cinematography, I mean, despite the, the narrative frustration of the, uh, and the cliches that are happening in the fight, I still think that there's a lot of tension. I think Bill Butler, who's only ever nominated for one Oscar, by the way, which is sad, but uh, I think is a, a great cinematographer and I like how the film looks basically everybody outside of Sylvester Stallone. Um, yeah, I feel like I spent the 30 minutes shitting on the movie, but I do think that for like a sports drama where you're supposed to like, like, I think it does do that, like it meets uh, expectations, I guess, like it's satisfactory. Mm-hmm. So I would have to give it two and a half out of five. Oh, and a shout out to Frank McRae, who plays the meat foreman. We didn't talk about, oh. Because he is in one of my favorite films from childhood, Batteries Not Included. Mm-hmm. So I always like seeing him. So that's it for Rocky Two. Mm-hmm. What do we have going on? Kind of a busy week. Um, and then I'll be in New York. Briefly. Well, you're going out of town, tw- like twice. Yeah, because I I I leave for New York, then I come back, and then the next morning fly to Boston. But um, and then after that, you're home for a couple weeks, and you're flying to Cannes. Yeah. So well, London to see oh, Isabella. Go to London to see Isabella Pair. Um, so there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. I think, I mean, depending, there's a screening every night this week, but, um, well, I, I know, wait, what? 
I, I all I have. Well, that's because you're not here all week. So we're seeing on we're, like we're seeing Back to Black that Danny Winehouse, Winehouse movie, and then we're seeing Challengers. Mm-hmm. Who the, directed that? Luca Guadagnino. What, what other movie? I I only have two on my list. Uh, the Guy Ritchie film is tomorrow. Oh, I didn't say I'd watch that. Oh, you didn't? Okay, well, you're. You want to watch that? Yeah. What is it called? The something unman. <laughs> Something I don't know. I don't think I'm a Guy Ritchie fan because I've watched a few. You had me watch a couple things. I liked Wrath the Man. We both like. Oh, what's the one that's um with Alexander Skarsgård where he's like he die like his he watches his father get killed and then he comes back to save his mom who I think is played by the Northman. That's not Guy Ritchie. That's not Guy Ritchie. That's Robert Eggers, man. Oh, who did the witch? I thought uh, Guy Ritchie did the Northman because <laughs> I did watch that movie. No, you know I think Guy Ritchie's best. You didn't. You skipped to those, his last one, The Covenant, Guy Ritchie with um, Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, I have no interest in seeing a Guy Ritchie, not on tax day. The you know, for everyone who doesn't know, uh, Monday the fifteenth is tax day. Yes. I know um, our account is mad because I gave him final documents yesterday. <laughs> well, I think he expects that. Um, but I am a pro. I, I'm a world class procrastinator few of you out there could do it like me and still be so high functioning so i'm actually quite proud of myself <laughs> well you're difficult to deal with though because you get stressed out easily because you're bad at time management that's true but if you think about my career and all the other things i do like mm-hmm. it's kind of a miracle that someone with my personality can accomplish so much <laughs> well let's not forget that there's you get a lot of help doing a lot of other things from who from say who? their name Nicholas Bell, <laughs> me. Keep this shit running. Like, you wouldn't keep this shit running. Like, uh, um, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare is the Guy Ritchie film. So I guess I'll be seeing that alone tomorrow, Ugh. which is fine. Well, the, the problem is you 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 think you're saving me time, but then you still want to review it, which means I still have to make a video. I still have to do all the other stuff. So it's not really an economy for me, but. We can talk about this off the air, mm-hmm. um, off call. Off what, call. what do they say? Offline. Offline. We're get, we're gonna table this. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say that uh, we can talk about this offline, meaning like shut the fuck up. <laughs> uh, but that's all I have. Anything else you want to say? Uh, me no. Ta ta. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha